He's seventh grade. So all the all the people and creatures from the secret cove have found Raymond and his mom at the Hotel Astor. And right now they're trying to follow them to develop a plan on how they can get Raymond back to the Gump. Let's get started. By lunchtime, the secret watchers were feeling thoroughly gloomy. It wasn't just that the bodyguards never let Raymond out of their sight. It was that Raymond himself was such a horrible boy. But it was Melisande who found out just what they were up against in rescuing him. She had got her uncle to move her into the fountain in Palm Court, and she was not having a nice time. This was because of the goldfish. In the Fortlands fountain, she had been alone. Here, she had to share with a dozen droopy-eyed, goggle-eyed, fan-tailed goldfish who flapped their tails in her face and dirtied the water with their droppings and their food. But Melisande was a trooper. She peered out from under the leaves. She watched Raymond and Mrs. Trottle guzzle a slab of fudge cake not an hour after they had finished breakfast. She watched the daft way Mrs. Trottle leered at the double bass player when the orchestra played for the guests at tea. And she watched as Doreen Trout came over to the fountain, sat down on the rim, and with her eyes still fixed on Raymond, took out her knitting bag. Knit two, slip one, murmured Doreen. Then she turned slightly, so slightly that Melisande hardly noticed it, and one of her needles plunged down into the water. It was all over in a second, and then Doreen got up and went back to stand behind Raymond, but the fan-tailed goldfish she had speared lay floating, belly up, between the leaves, while its life's blood draining away came down on Melisande's shocked and bewildered head. There was only one thing that cheered up the hidden wet watchers, and that was the cake. The cake was beautiful, the way it came in, all pink and glowing from the door beside the orchestra, and the balloons and the streamers that came down on top of it, and the lovely girl who burst out of it and danced, tossing her golden veils, while the band played music so dreamy and romantic that it made you weep. This was the cake that gave Cor his idea. All day the watchers had reported to him where he sat in the summer house with his briefcase beside him, taking notes, making maps of the hotel and the street outside, and thinking. Now he was ready to speak. It was, so, it was close on midnight, and everyone had come to listen. The plodger had brought Melisande, carrying her in a rep towel, and now she sat in the bird bath, looking worried because she felt no one knew quite how dreadful Doreen Trout could be. The ghost hovered on the steps. The troll called Henry Pendergast lay back in his chair, eating a leek which Gerke had put into his hand. He did not care for leeks, but he cared for Gerke, and he was doing his best with it. Ben had crept out of Trottle Towers, and he and Odge were crouched on the wooden floor, watching the, mis the mismaker. Among the banshees and the flower fairies were Odge's great aunt and a couple of ducks. Cor's plan, like all good plans, was simple. They could use the moment when the girl in the cake finished her dance, and the lights went out to capture the prince. Hans will bop him very carefully, of course, using only his little finger, and drop him into the cake as it's wheeled away. No one will think of looking for him there. But won't the girl in the cake get a shock when the prince is thrown on top of her? Won't she squeak? asked Gerke. Kor shook his head. No, he said, because the girl in the cake won't be there. The girl in the cake will be somebody else. He looked at Gerke from under his bushy brows. The girl in the cake, said the wizard in a weighty voice, will be you. Me? Gerke blushed to a deep rosy pink. She had always longed to come out of a cake, always. But when her mother was alive, it was no good even thinking about it. Jim mistress, who run about blowing whistles and shouting, play up, play the game, are not likely to let their daughters within miles of a cake. You mean I'm to do that dance? The one with the seven veils? Oh, but suppose I was left standing in my... And she didn't say the word knickers. She never had said it. Saying knickers was another thing her mother had not allowed. You won't be, said Cor. The lights will go off before that, when you still have one veil on. You'll do beautifully, Gerke, said Ben. They'll go mad for you. 
and everyone agreed. But after that, said the troll, how will you get the prince out of the cake and away? Hans may be invisible, but Raymond won't be. If we're not allowed to use magic on him, and the cake only gets wheeled as far as the artist's dressing room. Cor nodded. But there are other things in the dressing room, such as the instruments that the players in the orchestra use. Among them, a large double bass case. And he paused, and everyone looked at him expectantly, beginning to get the drift. As soon as the cake arrives in there, Hans will transfer the prince into the case, the, and the double bass player will carry him out of the hotel by the service stairs where the van will be waiting. But surely he'll notice, said Ernie, Raymond must weigh about five times as much as a double bass. Yes, but you see, it won't be the real double bass player. It will be Mr. Pendergast. And he turned to the troll. You shapeshifted yourself into a bank manager and a policeman. Surely you can manage a double bass player with a black mustache and a cowlick in the middle of his forehead. The troll nodded. No problem, he said. I got a good look at him tonight. The other details were quickly settled. Since they still had over a thousand pounds in banknotes, they were sure they could pay the real girl in the cake to let Gerky take her place. And I shall call Mrs. Trottle away with a phone message just before the cake comes in, said Cor. Odge will pretend to be the double bass player's little daughter and tell the doorman that her father has to come home early. As for you, Ben, you must wait on the fire escape and signal to the van driver as soon as Raymond is packed and ready so that he can back up against the entrance. And then off we go, all of us, through the gump with a whole day to spare. Ben, when the jobs were given out, sighed with relief. He had been afraid that they wouldn't let him help, and he wanted more than anything to be part of the team. But he felt guilty, too, because he knew that Odge thought he was going with them to the island. This time you're coming, said Odge. You have to. And Ben had said nothing. It was no good arguing, but you had to do what was right, and leaving Nanny Brown alone, ill as she was, couldn't ever be right. Only he wouldn't let himself think what it would be like after the rescuers had gone. He wouldn't let himself think of anything except for how to get Raymond Trottle out of Aster and bring the king and queen their long-lost son. Chapter 14 Nanny Brown moved her head restlessly on the pillow. She was worried stiff. Why had Lorena Trottle phoned to ask how she was? Lorena didn't care a tuppence how she was. Nanny knew that. Surely she couldn't be planning to send Ben away already in which case Ben ought to have the letter now. But what if the police came to the hospital to ask questions? Perhaps they'd pull her out of bed and take her to prison. Ben wouldn't like that. He felt things far too much. And here he was now. As he sat down beside her and took her hand, she thought what a handsome boy he was turning out to be. You've had your hair cut, Ben nodded, and Gerky pruned his hair with her pruning shears. She'd often to curl it, too, like she curled the petals of a rose, but Ben didn't think that Nanny would like him with curly hair. Thinking of the rescuers made him smile. They were all so excited about tonight and getting Raymond out. And then he looked much more closely at Nanny, and his heart gave a lurch. She was nothing but skin and bone. Does it hurt you, Nanny? Are you in pain? No, of course not, she lied. They'd offer her some stuff to take away the pain, but she'd never let them dope her when Ben came. What about Mrs. Trottle? How she's been? Uh, she's still away. Raymond, too. Nanny nodded. That was all right, then. If Lorena was away, she couldn't harm Ben, so the letter could wait. The nurses had promised faithfully to give it to Ben when the time came. And the servants? They've been all right, said Ben. They seem to let me do what I like, almost. But he was puzzled. The servants were almost too nice, and Mr. Fulton gave him an odd look now and again, as though he knew something. It made Ben uncomfortable, but he wasn't going to worry Nanny Brown. And Nanny wasn't going to worry Ben about the nonsense the young doctor had come up with that morning. Nanny knew her time was up, and she certainly didn't mean to go up to heaven stuck full of tubes. But as Ben left the ward, he found the nice nurse Celeste, Celeste waiting for him. Sister, like a word with you, Ben, she said. Would you come along to her room? The sister had dark hair and kind eyes. 
Ben, you're very young, but you're a sensible boy, and there doesn't seem to be anyone else. Ben waited. You're the next of kin, dear, aren't you? I mean, you're the only relation Mrs. Brown has? Yes, I'm her grandson. The nurse sighed and stabbed her pencil into a notepad. You see, Ben, the doctors are thinking of operating on your grandmother. It would be a shock to her system and cause her some pain, but it might give her a little bit longer. When would that be? The day after tomorrow. We thought you should know. The day after tomorrow. The last day of the, op the opening. It would be all over then, and the rescuer's gone. Well, if he'd had any doubts, that settled it. To let her go through an operation by herself was not to be thought of. I'd like to be there when she comes around, he said. I'd like to be with her. I'll ask the doctor, said the sister, and smiled at him. And here's where we'll stop for today at chapter 15, and we'll read a little bit more tomorrow.